The um, title of my series, as well as this talk, um, is Between Worlds. Now, which worlds and the relationship between them will develop with each subsequent talk? And the approach is very straightforward. We start with what is presented immediately to our eyes and we puzzle things out, understanding that very often the deepest things are literally hidden in plain sight. So that's how we're going to begin. The Pantheon in Paris presides over the city, uh, being one of the largest churches in the city and also sitting on one of the larger hills on the left bank. And um, this is a very early photograph, an image from 1865, showing our building haunting the skyline, a very beautiful image. So uh, the next image is a drawing from around um, 1785 by a very great architect and renderer, Charles de Wally representing Paris on the threshold of the French Revolution, and it includes contemplated projects as well as an image of the whole city. And the next image is a more contemporary image showing us a plan of the city on the threshold of revolution. And if you see our building, it's a rather large church. It's one of the larger buildings in the city. It is essentially the same size in terms of volume and square footage as Notre Dame Cathedral. So it was a major building in the city. And as we see it, there's good reason for it. And here's a lovely image, a contemporary image of the uh, building on a snowy day, um, probably sometime in December or so in Paris. So, uh, a voice from the past, as it were. On January 6th, in 1755, the Marquis de Marigny suggested the name of Charles Germain Soufflot to King Louis XIV for a new church dedicated to the patron saint of Paris, Saint Genevieve. Now, these are names which should um, catch our interest because they're certainly not familiar names and hopefully they'll become a little bit more familiar as we encounter our building both in time as well as space. So the earlier image uh, was from more or less the threshold of our building. Um, I haven't called it a church yet or a temple. Um, and as we move, move towards the crossing, um, this is the image we see. And uh, turning slightly to our left, what we see are, first of all, at the place where we would call the place of the altar, there's a sculpture group, two groups of individuals with a figure on a pedestal. Above this sculpture, sculpture group is a mosaic and against the gold ground, a number of hopefully somewhat familiar images and immediately to the right, um, a number of paintings behind columns. Now, this set of paintings was in part the subject matter and certainly the painter. Paul Lorenz was the subject matter of Micah's talk, which he gave um, last Friday at uh, the, muse the lecture hall in the museum in Provo of uh, the university. And the subject matter is the death of Saint Genevieve. And Saint Genevieve indeed is the original reason for this building on this site on one of the more prominent hills of the center of the city. Um, her death is uh, beautifully represented here. She is surrounded by her 
parish. These are her citizens. How many of you were at Micah's talk last Friday? So some of you will be familiar with these images. Um, and they are very much the bridge to what we'll be puzzling through and contemplating today. Um, this is the painter's uh, presentation sketch of the paintings which are then further developed as they're finally realized on the wall. And here is an image of our saint at the moment of her death as her soul is being received up in heaven and the intermediary figure of course is the angel and her grieving parishioners are shown in the foreground. Okay, so who was Saint Genevieve? She is a Roman, a Roman of the late antique period, a Roman of the 5th century AD during the period when the Western Roman Empire was dissolving. Furthermore, she is an exact contemporary with the wannabe Roman who essentially stabilized the dissolution of Romanitas in France by carving out of its uh, dissolution a kingdom, in other words, Clovis, the first um, French ruler, properly speaking, a Frank. And in this painting by Alma Tadema, we see his wife presiding over an interesting scene. The reason for the painting isn't the scene, or rather showing it to you, but his wife, who is uh, Clodil, who is the, not just the wife of uh, Clovis, but in many ways she is herself now a saint and the reason why he converted to Catholic Christianity. And his conversion to Catholic Christianity is the reason why the French can say that they have a religious and cultural continuity with the late Roman Empire. So. Here is an image also from our church of the baptism of Clovis, which is the key event. Um, the significance of underlying that he was baptized into Catholic Christianity is the other interlopers who carved up the Western Empire between themselves, the various Goths, Visigoths, Ostrogoths, and Vandals in North Africa, did not convert to Catholic Christianity, but to a heretical sect called Arian Christianity, and therefore accelerated the destruction and dissolution of Romanness in the West. So here's a map showing, giving us a glimpse of the eventual conquests of Clovis. He established a dynasty called the Merovingian dynasty, which ultimately gave rise to Charlemagne and his reconstitution of an imperial Western presence in the year 800 AD. So, back to our saint. So, um, here's an image of Northern Gaul in a really terrible moment when another group of barbarians called the Huns who were far less civilized um, and amenable to being converted to Romanitas than the various Gauls, or rather Goths and other Germans, um, invaded northern, Ital northern, northern Gaul, as it was known at that time. Um, and this is an image which shows all the cities that were destroyed by them. They were on their way to Paris while a Roman army was heading north to try to stop them and eventually stop them at the site of Chalon. Now Paris is one of only three cities here that was not destroyed. And Saint-Geneviève Saint is the reason. As you can see from this um, aerial image of the Roman city, of Paris at the time. Most of it was on the left bank. There was some of it on the island, which would become the Ile de la Cité, but it had no walls. So it was futile to defend it with an army. And Saint Genevieve is said to have said, leave it up to us women. And um, her origin is said to be as a shepherdess, a humble person. We will pray and our prayer will 
deflect Attila and his hordes. And indeed, it, it, it happened, and so the city was spared. This is a pretty big deal in antiquity when um, an invading army, once they sacked your city, that was very often it for a city. Um, many cities never recovered. Here is a plan of the Roman city, um, as you can see, extremely exposed, um, where the later city developed mostly on the right bank at the time was largely a swamp. And here is a close-up drawing, another reconstruction of the city in late antiquity, which is to say just before and during the life of saint Genevieve, the island of the city was fortified, whereas the rest of the city was not. And the future um, early to high medieval city of Paris really develops from the fortified island, when in the ninth century, the, another wave of barbarians um, attack the city, the Vikings. It was this city, the city on the island with its late antique walls that ultimately fended them off. So uh, today um, there are any number of traces of the Roman city that can be teased out both be from what's standing above ground, namely the remains of the theater amphitheater and also the old baths which were turned into a large medieval house. And this is a glimpse of the development of the revived city as it stood at its height in the high Middle Ages when it was one of the key centers of learning in the West um, at the time of uh, St. Thomas Aquinas. And the left bank really is an extension of the, um, the circle around um, Notre Dame, which is actually the part of the university. So, the other great story of Attila the Hun being stopped in his tracks is represented by this great uh, Baroque car frieze, which shows uh, Leo I through his prayers and through physically confronting Attila and his hordes with the help of the saints Peter and Paul, um, persuading Attila to head back north, and eventually what he did is he just went around the Alps and attacked northern France. So, Saint Genevieve. Um, as we step back from these paintings, uh, we look up and we notice an elaborate set of vaults. These vaults are cut stone. They're not plaster, they're not hung from the superstructure, they're self-supporting. And they point to what is pretty much unique to France in the um, Renaissance through the Baroque through the 18th century. It's the art of stereotomy, which is the art of cutting stone to create very elaborate and light looking supports over a space um, that are, because they are entirely of stone, largely um, imperviable to fire. Okay, that'll play, um, that'll be significant um, in a little bit. So here we are looking at the focus of our church. As I said, at the place of the altar, we have this monument. There's an inscription to the National Convention. Um, you see a number of figures extending the, their arms in what is an uncannily familiar image to 20th century people. But remember, we're in the 18th century. It's the beginning of the revolutionary republic that is being commemorated in the year uh, 1792. But above them, you have an image of Christ next to an angel between two nailing, kneeling saints and the image of Mary um, slightly in the background. So who are the saints? The kneeling saint to the right of this image, of course, is Saint Genevieve. How do we know? She has the shepherd's staff. She was a shepherdess. On the left, of course, we recognize that saint. It's, of course, Saint Joan of Arc, um, a great figure in later French history who eventually 
um, had a big role to play in expelling the English once and for all from their attempt to conquer northern France. In the center is Christ. And next to him is an angel, which is the embodiment of the spirit of France. So, two images. And these images stand as poles apart vis-a-vis -vis each other. The sculptural image is a denial of what is hovering above them, quite deliberately, the revolutionary French regime changed pretty much everything you could, sh they could in terms of the public reality, the cultural reality of France. Not only did they abolish the church and um, stole all its properties, but they also changed the calendar, created a whole new cycle of feast days, um, even changed the length of the week from seven days to 10 days. So think about that. He had two extra days before the weekend comes, and the weekend was only one day, every 10th day. So um, what we're looking at is another set of paintings in our building, which, as we'll see, started out as a church, um, a series of paintings commemorating the life of St. Joan. There are other paintings. Uh, most of the paintings commemorate the life of St. Genevieve, but a good number, St. Joan, Charlemagne, Clovis, um, and, uh, and Saint-Denis, other key figures in the Christian story of France. Here we step back from this image and look at our building overall. So this is an image of Paris uh, a little over 100 years ago, probably a photograph taken between 1890 and 1900 the building as it was completed. And turning slightly to the left of the building, we see another church and between them a gap. So what is the significance of this gap? This is where the original church of Saint Genevieve was built. It was built um, by Clodile, the wife of Clovis, and it became the royal church in which the remains of Clovis and his family were interned, as well as Saint Genevieve, and um, it was dedicated to the saints Peter and Paul, the same two saints who um, Leo I prayed to to cause the hordes of Attila to head back north. Here's a plan of the church um, at its foundation level, full of uh, the indication of many graves. So this was her original church. Um, it vanished at the beginning of the 19th century. And so what happened between? Well, before we go there, what is the Church of Saint Genevieve today? There is no Church of Saint Genevieve today. However, her remains are now what's left of them because most of them were destroyed by the utopian revolutionaries in the um, last decade of the 18th century. What was collected from what remained is now in the Church of Saint Etienne du Mont, which is the Church of Saint Stephen on the mountain. Remember our, our hill? Here's a photograph of the church as it is today. Um, an interior glimpse of the church. And here is the side chapel with the relics of our saint, Saint Genevieve. So, bracket all that, and we go back to the beginning. And the beginning of this monument, which is somehow between temple and church, begins with uh, the young Louis XV. Poor Louis XV, he became king at an extremely young age, at the age of five. Here is a spectacular painting by Hyacinth Rignon of the king in his coronation robes. And here is a very melancholy painting painted after the fact the woman, the woman, the one woman in this image, which presides over to the left-hand side of the painting, is the king's nanny. And why was this painting painted and dedicated to her? Because um, there was an outbreak of smallpox um, 
around um, seven, yeah, 1714, and um, it took out not only the child's father, but his grandfather as well, and soon afterwards the king himself, Louis XIV, died. And so the fact that the nurse kidnapped, the, literally t kidnapped the child and hid the child in the attic of the palace at Versailles meant that the child was not killed by its, his doctors. It was medicine which killed the future Louis XV's both father and grandfather. Um, notably, what they used to do, some of you may know, is there was the idea that illness was some kind of ether that lived in the blood, and if you opened up the veins of the patient and let them bleed, um, this would allow the toxins to somehow evaporate. So many people were killed by bleeding, including the founder of this country, George Washington, who had a cold that became a flu, and he was bled to death by his doctors as well. So she certainly deserved that painting and the thanks of the French people for rescuing their monarch. So um, in a few decades later, um, two decades later, in 1744, during one of the many unfortunate wars of the 18th century, um, Louis XV was in northern France and he became ill. He became seriously ill in the city of Metz, and in, his, in the extreme of his illness, he, played, he paid, prayed to Saint Genevieve, and what his vow exactly was is unclear from the documents, but it is understood retrospectively that he vowed that he would rebuild her church. I'm not sure that that's exactly what he vowed, but he went back to Paris, sorry, when he recovered, visited the church, and the uh, monks, because it was an abbey, um, interceded with him and asked him to improve their rather dilapidated late medieval, um, really more Romanesque, somewhat late Gothic church. And um, 10 years later, a pro project for rebuilding the church was enacted. So who was the overseer of the project? It was the Marquis de Marigny. The Marquis de Marigny was a rather young man at the time. He was in his 20s. How does a young man become the overseer of such a huge project? Well, he happened to be the younger brother of the king's current mistress, Madame de Pompadour. Okay, this probably strikes us today as kind of the wrong way to go about things, and perhaps in the ultimate scheme of things it is, but we are in the 18th century. So, and Madame de Pompadour was an exceedingly cultured, actually quite artistic, sensitive, um, very intelligent lady, and what she did is she gave her brother an education. She sent him to um, Europe on the Grand Tour. He spent a number of years in Rome, and his tutor was an architect. This architect, Jacques Germain Soufflot. And so when the young man came back to Paris and was um, inaugurated as the overseer of all the king's works in the whole of France, he not too surprisingly suggested to the king that rather than the king's favorite architect at that time, um, another very, very great architect and artist, Ange Gabriel, rather than him being the architect of this new church, it should be this relatively unknown Mr. Soufflot, most of whose works at that point were not in Paris. And here in this portrait, we see an image of his great project. Um, and what is represented in this painting is this, the original presentation design perspective for the new church. Um, 
And this engraving was made around 1757 after the church was underway. So this represented the new church. Notice in the lower left-hand image, we have saint Etienne du Mont, um, which will haunt our story from here on in. So, the architect, Mr. Soufflot. Mr. Soufflot um, looks like a very elegant gentleman here. Um, when you're looking at a portrait painting in the 18th century, it's not a photograph. It's not very likely that this is what he looked like hovering over his drafting. Um, he is shown very much as a courtier, as of course he would have to be, because he wasn't simply a tradesman. So, here we have a short overview of the key moments in our building. 1744, the vow at Metz of Louis XV. Um, the end of the war, you can't start building a building during a war because we're not in a modern economy where we can borrow from the future to pay for the present. Um, if you don't have the money, you Borrowing is extremely prohibitive, and all the money went into the war. However, once the war was over and peace returned, and after a couple of good harvests, um, you can initiate a project. So we're in 17, um, 1755, and in 1756, Construction begins, however, a new war starts. The terrible Seven Years' War, which ultimately gives rise to your republic. Okay, I'm Canadian, as you probably heard, so that's why I'm calling it your republic. Um, even as the war is continuing, because it is a very high priority project, they at least lay out the foundations and the crypts of the crypt of the building, and then in 1764, Louis XV lays the cornerstone. And this is a wonderful painting showing the great ceremony of the laying of the cornerstone. So does that mean there was a huge portico already built? Not at all. This is a very large painting. Now, some of you here have worked on a very large painting, um, 20 feet by 60 feet. This is a much bigger painting. So for the ceremony of laying the cornerstone, a huge, as it were, rendered painting of the elevation was at full scale on scaffolding raised on the site. So as the cornerstone was laid, the king, his court, and the pop people of Paris could see what was coming around the corner, as it were. Now, at the same time, Charles de Wally, who I'd mentioned earlier as um, the author of that plan that we got a glimpse of, of the city of Paris in the last decade before the revolution, produced this truly spectacular rendered elevation of the interior of the future church, and it's actually one of the great drawings of the 18th century, bar none. Um, so this is uh, Soufflot's first vision of the church. Rather than solid piers, you have these um, more open uh, piers made of both a wall and then a number of columns. There is a fairly traditional vault with coffering above these piers. And in the center of the image hovering over it at the crossing is a kind of baldacchino that supports the reliquy with the relics of Saint Genevieve. So she would have occupied the center of this new church and beyond at the farther end, the eastern end, would be the high altar which is just hovering over the, um, the image. This is another contemporary image of the same design. Really a fine image if we hadn't seen the image, the earlier image. Um, so, what was Mr. Soufflot up to? Well, clearly it had something to do with the columns and something to do with the vaulting. And where does this come from? Here is a section through the transept of his first, actually, yes, this is his first design with the more solid vaults. Um, 
over the space, a much more traditional looking image. And this is the second design as he developed the interior volumes, um, taking through the long, through the length of the church, you see the porch at the right hand side and the area of the high altar. On the left hand side in the center, you see the, um, the uh, reliquy with the relics of Saint Genevieve floating um, under the dome, and then you see the stairs leading to the crypt below the eastern part of the church. And a sketch that is contemporary with this second project, actually a very fine sketch that probably takes as its starting point to Wally's um, original rendered perspective. So, she w her remains would literally have floated over the center of the church. And of course they should, because after all, she's the patron saint of Paris, and this would have been the second church of Paris. Of course, the first church is the cathedral on the Ile de la Cité. And this is a elevation of the second design with the original project, um, not exactly looking like the final dome of um, Soufflot's um, design, which was then commenced to be built. Eventually, the church was realized, and these, the, this is a, a both three sections through the portico and the narthex of our church. We won't dwell on it too much. We'll look at this detail. Now, like many of his great predecessors of the French style that we call the Gothic, but in which actually in the Gothic period was simply called the French manor, um, they were pushing the limits of stone construction. And so very self-consciously, Mr. Soufflot said, I want my church to be a fusion of the best of the Roman with the best of the Gothic. So he is using Gothic engineering to create a Roman style church. And of course, the most characteristic aspect of the Roman is the Roman column and the preeminent column of course is the Corinthian column of which this church is made of. This is a technical drawing taken through the port showing that not only are they using um, very light um, pre-cut stones which is the art of stereotomy is really the art of projective geometry so that you can um, to the millimeter project what the stone, the shape of the stone, where it fits in a larger assemblage of stones so they can simply be placed in place on some kind of formwork. But also the, the first extensive use, actually no, it's not the first, but an early extensive use of iron rods and ties to keep it all stable and tied together. This was very risky, and in fact, immediately, jealous other architects piped in, um, namely a person by the name of Pierre Pat, who said, it's gonna collapse, it's gonna collapse, bad. And so there was a lot of debate um, around the king and his circle and his courts, should we go ahead with it? But ultimately they trusted their architect and they built it even the very slender piers which support the dome. There we have 1770, Mr. Pierre Putt launching his polemic as it were. And then a few years later, poor Louis XV, who didn't succumb to smallpox as a small child, namely because um, his nurse took him out of the way, ultimately catches smallpox and dies a gruesome death, and is succeeded by his very young grandson, um, who will become Louis XVI. The portico is finished, um, and then for that rest of the de decade um, after Soufflot's death, the superstructure and the dome are completed by his successor. And this is a model which we can still see today in uh, our building, which shows the, the project for the completion of the church by Soufflot's successor. And um, 
It is a technical model, which is to say, it doesn't show simply the design, but also the cutaways show how it is constructed as well. It's a spectacular model, and they had to make it because they had to persuade the new king and his advisors that all of this was going to hang together. So um, it's uh, both a documentary and a polemical tour de force, um, and a really beautiful building. So here are a number of drawings um, taken through the dome showing its construction and its more or less invisible uh, buttressing. And unfortunately, cracks appeared. So um, the piers had to be made um, double the thickness that Soufflot intended, and that's what we have today. But it's still standing, so. Well, he didn't, he didn't cook this up out of his head. Art comes out of previous art, which is to say art begets art, buildings beget buildings, and the paradigmatic building of the early 18th century was the recently completed Church of St. Paul's in London, and its engineering is also cutting edge. You have Englishmen working also within a Gothic tradition of stonemaking, and um, Essentially, Soufflot took St. Paul's as his model that he then modified and transformed. Here is a photograph of St. Paul's as it looks like today. And you can see that there's a direct relationship between St. Paul's and the dome of St. Genevieve as Soufflot finally projected it. It's quite a distance from his initial ideas for the dome. Okay. So, you notice the big windows? Don't forget those big windows as well as we proceed. Um, we haven't gotten very far in terms of time. Our building is still under construction and uh, barely complete when the fateful year of 1789 comes along. There's a drawing by Soufflo of a project to create a more monumental space around his building, namely framing it, projecting an avenue extending from it with two buildings, um, terminating the avenue and creating a piazza in front of the building, and a projected third and probably fourth building mirroring the space right in front of the portico with the two other churches. We see the original Saint Genevieve with its abbey still there, and the Church of St. Stephen on the Mountain, which, by the way, developed out of a side chapel of St. Genevieve. Um, here's an image of uh, the left bank um, in 1770 as the building was being constructed. And on the lower part of the building, we see the, the cross of the plan of, the, of our building. And we can see it is indeed a very large building, the largest building on the left bank at the time. And this is a drawing from 1790, the year after the fateful year, 1789. So you all recognize that date, 1789. What happened on July 14th in 1789? The Bastille was besieged and fell, and all its armament fell into the hands of the rabble of Paris, and it is the official, um, the official moment of the beginning of what we call the French Revolution. It isn't really the revolution had actually be begun, but it is certainly a uh, pivotal moment in the unfolding of the French Revolution. So here is a plan of Paris as it stood uh, 100 years ago and as it is more or less today. With the site of our building, what's happened is a lot of boulevards have been cut through the fabric of the Renaissance and Baroque city. And um, that just to orient you, and here's the plan of our building and its immediate, immediate surroundings as it stands today. Notice that the site of the old church of Saint Genevieve is now the Rue Clovis. A rather sad end. Um, 
So, and here is a plan of this area still as it was being developed in the first decade of the 19th century, 1809. So, what happened between 1780 and 1809? Quite a bit. A photograph of our building around 1900, the portico, and we're now going to focus on the columns. So what's this obsession with columns? Well, it's a very old obsession, clearly. It goes back to the beginnings of the Renaissance. Um, the Corinthian column was the preeminent column and the preferred column for Roman temples and for the ornamenting of other buildings with monumental columns, such as baths, etc. And there's a lot of theory here, so I'm going to step back and uh, give you a little bit of background. By the middle of the 18th century, which is to say at the time when a, our building was conceived, this was the most popular book in France in enlighten, enlightened circles pertaining to architecture. It wasn't written by an architect. It was written by a disgraced abbé. You usually are not told that he was disgraced. Mr. Logier, is, and it's entitled An Essay on Architecture, and this is its frontispiece, and it is a virulent polemic against the dominant architecture of the previous two or three hundred years, and most directly against that style that we call the Baroque. And essentially, it is a call to go back to nature and the natural principles of architecture, as they call it, which amounts to the natural principles of construction. And here we see the discarded architecture under the embodiment of lady architecture. You see the little cube head, which is a, an embodiment of the genius of architecture. And he's light, light, lighting the way to the future which is a kind of natural hut. Now, there's a very good book that I recommend to those of you who are students out there, entitled On Adam's House in Paradise, that is full of a lot of hut talk, that takes the whole trajectory of the origins of architecture as somehow the definitive model for how architecture sh should proceed. These are very new thoughts, actually, in the 18th century, even though they have an older genealogy. So what is haunting all of this? What is haunting all of this is the Enlightenment, and above all else, a person who you should all recognize because he continues to haunt our world, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And Jean-Jacques Rousseau's polemic which is very much directed against the very foundation of his world that he was born into, a utopian rethinking of the human condition and basing a new society on the natural principles, supposedly, of the human condition, which you can just discover by thinking through it. And he produced... Um, two very famous works, his discourses, which were published just about the time as our building was starting, and his social contract, which ultimately is directly responsible for the dissolution of his world and still corrodes the foundations of our world. Okay, however, this didn't come out of nowhere. Um, as I pointed out, a, an abbé, which is a lower-ranking cleric, not a priest, um, would not be writing about these principles in the middle of the 18th century, contemporary with Rousseau, had they not been a part of public discourse for many, many decades previous to him. He's not an architect. He's not a professional. And the real beginnings of the Enlightenment, you have to go back a century earlier. And the first modern book of architecture was produced by another non-architect, actually a doctor, I believe, Claude Perrault, who somehow, through a very capable 
the ability to work around patronage and use it to his ends uh, became the person who somehow in mutilating the great design for the east facade of the new Louvre of uh, Louis XIV in the early years of his sole rule has ultimately gotten the credit for the design. Well, what he did to the design is he took out as much ornament as he could and then he said, hey, this is my design. Um, a great uh, achievement in political maneuvering and written rhetoric. So in your courses, you're told that this is his design. It's not. It's actually the design of Francois d'Orbay um, and Louis Laveau, the two royal architects of the king, who gave us Versailles in its first and second forms. Okay, as I mentioned, the other great architect of the period was um, Ange Gabriel, and as you can see, there is a relationship between the east facade of the Louvre and um, Gabriel's great public work, which we now know as the uh, Place de la Concorde, but which was originally known as the Place Louis XV, the Place Louis XV. So columns and an obsession with columns is not just a mid 18th century enlightenment interest, nor is relating Greco-Roman architecture to Gothic a new idea. Here we have the Royal Chapel at Versailles, which was um, under construction 50 years before our building began. And um, the whole is clearly a trans translation or rather a fusion of the Gothic with the high classical. That this is the view from the king's uh, balcony. This is the view from the threshold. And here we're looking up into the vaulting. And here we are looking straight up into this rather remarkably realized beautiful interior, which is simultaneously Roman and high Baroque. So no necessary conflict there. And this, of course, is emblematic of the insp inspiration, the French High Gothic, which more properly you should simply call the French style. Now, there's a long trajectory. Art begets art, architecture comes from architecture, and columnar interiors are a very Roman invention. This is a photograph of the great, uh, fairly well-preserved Basilica of Santa Maria Maggiore in um, Rome. Here's an image of the sadly now lost and not exactly um, well-rebuilt Church of St. Paul's outside the walls. And these interiors are the starting point for our Renaissance. So here we have Brunelleschi's um, partially realized to his vision interior of the Basilica of San Lorenzo in Florence. I'm showing these to you to point out that it's not necessarily an enlightenment idea to create interiors with many columns. And it's not simply logier. Um, and I'll underline why in a few minutes. So here is a copy of what is probably Brunelleschi's first original design and vision for the Church of San Lorenzo. And what I want you to focus on are those circles, those big circles and those smaller circles. What do those circles indicate? What they indicate are vaulting. So Brunelleschi's original vision was an attempt to fuse late Roman Byzantine vaulting with a basilican columnar interior. Here is, of course, one of the great prototypes, um, the Church of St. Mark's in Venice, which is a, a replica of an even greater prototype, which has since vanished, the Church of the Holy Apostles in Constantinople. And a photograph. Vaulting is cool. Why is vaulting cool? Well, if you're a medieval to high Gothic, to high Baroque architect, what does vaulting offer other than a reasonably fireproof interior? 
lots of surface for fantastic collections of images of the transcendent realm, the angels, Christ, the saints, and storytelling. So, and of course, um, the prototype of the attempt to fuse these various worlds in a new way in the early Renaissance is represent, Renaissance rather, is represented by this image, which is an image of Bramante's first project for St. Peter's. So, columns, yes, but not columns alone. Columns, walls, and the extension of walls in the third dimension floating above us, i.e. vaults. The great portico of our church, of course, very columnar. And now we look again at our interior, and what do we see? We see vaulting. We see a vaulting which has been carved back. There are no images there, and that's not because Mr. Soufflot did not intend there to be images. He certainly did. And we see columns, but columns in relation to pilasters against walls. Because Mr. Soufflot also understood, he had a, certainly a very good grasp of basic basic engineering, that you just can't build a building simply out of columns, it's going to collapse. You need walls to support the columns, both internally and along the perimeter as well. So the piers are not a contradiction, unlike what some of the literature about this church will say. Really, the only difference between his original vision and what was realized was he had to or rather his successor had to make the piers thicker around the crossing supporting the dome. We're looking up at the dome at the crossing. Now the dome is on the lower part of the image and we see one of the smaller domes, the pendentive domes, um, over the four, one of the four transepts. So there is a central dome and there are four smaller domes along the four transepts of our church. Now, this project inspired other churches at the same time, and this is an internal perspective of um, the early project for the new church of La Madeleine, which was going to grace the center of um, the then under construction, uh, Pla now Place de la Concorde, then Place Louis the 15th. As you know, the eventual Madeleine is very different. It's actually a huge building that looks like a Roman temple. Okay, columns were certainly a big thing towards the end of the 18th century. This is a temporary construction made for a ball late in the reign of um, Louis the 16th. Here is a truly visionary project for a gigantic church by Etienne Louis Boulet um, from 1780-1781, columns and vaults. And this is a melancholy image of the great hall that was constructed to begin the first sessions of the Estates General, which is the trigger of our events of 1789 that we now call the French Revolution. So, back to our Yes, the first incidents of the French Revolution, the fall of the Bastille, the sacking of Vers the first sack of Versailles, the kidnapping of the king and the royal family, and taking them prisoner, taking them to Paris. At the same time, our building is completed, the dome is completed, and we have the first phase of the French Revolution. So the French Revolution was not just one event, but many events, and a new constitution was created in the late 1789, early 1790, and it was a constitutional monarchy. And Louis XVI was reinstalled, no longer as a ruler through the grace of God, but as a constitutional monarch with a two-chamber um, parliament, with a cabinet, and all the familiar trappings that we know more directly from England. 
and the presiding figure of this first phase of this evolving regime was a fellow by the name of Count Mirabeau. Poor Count Mirabeau, he tried to reconcile irreconcilables, it kind of wore him down and he died. And this is an image of the death of the liberal monarchy or liberal republic, um, as you can say, showing when the king he becomes imprisoned inside the convention and a few months later there's no monarchy. So what happened in 1792 was a mob attacks the royal palace, the king is imprisoned, you have the September massacres and the so-called First Republic, which really, I guess it is a, a true republic, no longer a constitutional monarchy. Now, in the interim, our building, which had not been dedicated to Saint Genevieve, because it was still under construction, was being finished and a new designation for it emerged in that troubling two years. And back to Charles de Wally, the illustrator of uh, the first project of uh, Soufflo. Here we have his project for the new project, a pantheon. So he took this idea seriously and he fused a pyramid with the building. He um, solved the problem of those cracks in the piers by eliminating the dome, supporting it with massive buttresses from his pyramid and creating a circle of columns in the air. That's the plan of his project and um, there's a section through his project. So the eventual, then his project was a little too over the top so somebody else was given the project um, and the eventual result is represented by this drawing. Basically what they did is they filled up all the windows they got rid of all the sculpture that showed it to be a church. They substituted new sculpture celebra celebrating the new regime. They took away the lantern and they gave us the appearance of our new church and they gave it a, a new name. And in fact, the first inhabitant of this new institution was none, under, none other than Mirabeau who was interred there on the 4th of April, 1791, and the building, which never quite became the Church of Saint Genevieve, became a pantheon. Now, why a pantheon? Well, because of this building in Rome, the building we still know as the Pantheon, a mysterious name, a subject for another lecture. But literally it means pan is all in theon the gods, so somehow embodying or celebrating or commemorating all the gods, although today it's a church um, dedicated to Mary and the martyrs, the early Christian martyrs. Here's a photograph of it. And like many churches, it had tombs and the most celebrated of its, in, of its occupants is buried in an edicula on the sort of middle right of your image, Raphael. It's because Raphael was buried in the Pantheon and because of Raphael's cultural preeminence that these revolutionaries thought of naming their new institution a Pantheon, a name with a pagan resonance, a non-ecclesiastical resonance, even though the original Pantheon is still a church. Well, poor Louis ultimately was decapitated in the former Place Louis Cannes, which became the Place de la Révolution, which eventually became the Place de la Concorde. So, here's an image of Louis facing his ultimate end, painted while he was a prisoner of the First Republic. So, that Republic had a very fast history. It went from one horror to another and ultimately the horror of children and all kinds of other innocents being executed um, by the guillotine. And uh, a fellow by the name of Robespierre um, ultimately being the victim of what he started. Now, behind the 
sculpture group at the high altar. This is a photograph of what stands behind it. You see this sculpture that doesn't quite fit with its back to the group. That is the current location of a sculpture to Mr. Mirabu, who was the um, presiding figure over this constitutional monarchy. And um, he's the first occupant of our building. The second occupant of our building is this fellow, Marat, uh, the great painting by Jacques-Louis David. It's called The Death of Marat. He was assassinated by this lady, Charlotte Corday. And he was a great martyr of the height of this period of the French Revolution known as the Reign of Terror. So he replaced Mirabeau. Mirabeau was, his remains were taken out of the building buried somewhere in the city in an unmarked grave, we don't know where, and Mr. Marat took over. And then shortly thereafter, a couple of months over, later this person was buried in our building, or so-called Pantheon. It's none other than Voltaire, who is, along with um, Rousseau, one of the two primary presiding figures over the dissolution of what is called the Ancien Regime, the regime before the revolution. Um, here is a drawing of the interior of a building as it looked like as it was about to become a pantheon with the remains of Voltaire taken from where he was initially buried to be enshrined in this new building. This image is important because it's one of the few images which shows the church as it would have been lit by its original windows before they were all blocked up to make it a more funereal interior. And the next person to be buried, not too surprisingly, of course is Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And here we have Rousseau in a kind of version of a Doric primitive hut um, in the crypts of our building. Well, the, uh, the height of the second phase of the revolution and the reign of terror is represented by this painting where a new religion was proclaimed during what was called the Festival of the Supreme Being, a strange amalgam of atheism with deism that was being promulgated by um, none other than this fellow, Mr. Robespierre, the high priest of the reign of terror, who ultimately, well, he was just killing way too many people in his own immediate circle. So his own immediate circle ganged up against him and he became, and all his allies, um, the last in that festival of butchery that we know as the Reign of Terror. This is a wonderful painting, rather painting, engraving, symbolic of the Reign of Terror. What it shows is the pyramid behind him is the crypt where all the rest of France is buried. And um, Mr. Robespierre is now taken over the role of executioner and he is about to decapitate the executioner and be the sole survivor of his utopian vision, and his utopian vision was very straightforward. If you weren't ready for utopia, you had to be eliminated. And of course, most human beings are not ready for utopia. So the eventual result of this utopian drive is that pretty much everybody dies. And the left person standing is the person who's, as it were, the puppeteer. So, the person who rescued the French Revolution, although he's not usually properly credited for this anymore, is none other than Napoleon. This is a wonderful painting by Francois Girard of Napoleon during the moment of his greatest triumph, the victory at Austerlitz, um, and the beginning, the effective beginning of what's called the First Empire. He stabilized the French Revolution. He solved the problem of the budget. How did he solve the problem of the budget? Well, um, after, <laughs> after robbing everybody in France of all their money, this problem of bankruptcy was not resolved. 
And so they decided to rob the rest of Europe. So you have the Napoleonic Wars. So as long as the wars um, played out, um, the budget was in the black. And um, then the wars ended. But in the meantime, what Napoleon did, and it was his great achievement, is he brought social peace back into France by restoring the Catholic Church and by trying to reconcile the old regime with some of the ideals of the new regime, the French Revolution, institutionalizing them, bringing social stability. And one of the things he did was he put the pantheon part of our church into the basement and dedicated the upper part of our building to Saint Genevieve. And so it's the first time it became a church, um, but not much happened to it in terms of ornament. Um, there was some redecorating or decorating of the interior to turn it into a church, and so this is a perspective of the interior of our now church in, during the Napoleonic period. The person who inaugurated and dedicated the church to Saint Genevieve formally was Napoleon's successor, the younger brother of the late Louis XV, who comes to be known as Louis XVIII. Louis XVII is the young son of um, Louis XVI, who never reigned, but died a prisoner in the hands of the Republic. And, um, it was Louis XVIII who ultimately brought true stability back to France, ending these terrible wars and, um, and resolving the budget problems. By the way, there was only one free election during the period of the French Revolution um, in the uh, 1790s, and the royalists won overwhelmingly. So there were no further free elections through the rest of the revolutionary and Napoleonic period. So the much uncelebrated and unjustly ignored Louis XVIII um, brought peace to France. Unfortunately, his younger brother who succeeded him, he didn't have any children. Charles X was less flexible and so there was another revolution. Anyhow, um, this is just a sketch of what I just covered. It was under Louis the 18th that um, a pediment, the exaltation of the cross was completed. And the, the uh, what we call the Pantheon began to function as the Church of Saint Genevieve. It didn't last. Louis the as I said, Louis XVIII was succeeded by his younger brother, Count Artois became Charles X. And you had another revolution, the revolution of July 1830. And a close relative, a cousin, in fact, the son of the person who signed the death sentence of Louis XVI, who becomes King Louis Philippe, offered himself to the revolutionaries and we have um, the period of almost 20 years of the, another constitutional um, mo monarchy. But to placate the revolutionaries, um, Louis Philippe kicks out poor um, Saint Genevieve. He turns the building into a pantheon and then he does nothing for 20 years. So. He keeps the whole thing a little quiet. Um, Soufflo was the last person to be properly buried, or in fact, the only person to be properly buried as a Christian in the Church of Saint Genevieve at this point um, during the reign of Charles X. Then you have another revolution, the Revolution of 1848. The end of the reign of Louis Philippe. This is a painting which shows the kerfuffle of the Revolution of 1848 in front of the City Hall in Paris. And another quick overview, I have to speed up here. And a new ruler, the nephew of Napoleon I, ultimately becomes Napoleon III. 
And it is under Napoleon III that once again the church, the quasi-temple becomes a church. And briefly, um, the relics of St. Genevieve are brought into the church, and it is this period that gives us all the paintings that um, we caught glimpses of earlier in our church, um, and um, including the great cycle of the life of St. Genevieve um, that uh, we began our lecture with. So, sadly, Napoleon only reigns for around 20 years. Um, his uh, reign collapses because of Bismarck and Germany and that whole business which ultimately gives us much of the 20th century, but I'll speed up. Um, Paris is besieged, um, Paris falls, the government surrenders to the Germans. The citizens of Paris in various districts don't like the terms of the surrender, they rebel, and we have this terrible period of four, four months known as the Paris Commune, which goes in an orgy of destruction and ultimately burns down. They tried to burn down the whole Louvre, but they only ended up, thanks to a lot of energetic curators and ordinary citizens in rescuing most of the art collection and only the palace part of the Louvre is ultimately destroyed. They tore down the Vendôme column, they burnt the city hall. They actually tried to burn the Pantheon but there wasn't much woodwork to burn so it survived, but it got quite a few direct hits, both from German artillery and then from uh, French artillery as they recaptured the city. So a lot of the building had to be rebuilt. And briefly, there was one golden moment where it looked like a new king would be proclaimed, a descendant of uh, Charles X, who would have been uh, Henry V, but sadly, the contradictions in French society were too extreme. In the, in the 1870s, there was a royalist parliament, but Henry could not be persuaded to give up the white flag of the monarchy, and he could not tolerate the tricolor of the French Revolution, and his compromise idea of the royal coat of arms on the white part, with the red and the blue on the outer part, was, were not accepted. And so eventually that um, didn't happen. And oh, between the 1780s and the 1790s, the whole polit political cultural spectrum shifted. And when um, Victor Hugo died in 1885, sorry, I meant 1870s and 1880s, in 1885, there was a huge ceremonial funeral of him and he gets buried in the Pantheon and the Pantheon from that point on becomes a Pantheon and no more church. So today the pediment of our building is very secular. There is no cross. We have victory or glory or the incarnation of France celebrating all its great highly um, motivated high achievers, and um, that's what you see inside. And in the early 20s, of course, not too surprisingly, what presided over the center of the church was none other than Rodin's thinker, um, the very antithesis of Saint Genevieve. Um, although, as art begets art, Rodin's thinker is closely modeled after the image of the contemplative life by Michelangelo in the Medici Chapel. So look it up and you'll see it's just a kind of crude, barbaric, nude version of the contemplative life by Michelangelo. The cycle of paintings was finished. Um, including the, the two at the threshold in the narthex representing the uh, life of Saint Denis. So the collision between the Ancien Regime and the revolutionaries was better negotiated in the last decade of the 19th century so that a great circle of painters were allowed to finish their paintings and the revolutionary ideals were enshrined not in painting but in sculpture. 
So around between 1900 and the 1920s, both immediately before and after World War I, the cycle of monumental sculptures comm commemorating the heroes and the heroic ideals of the utopianism we call the French Republic were realized. So you have this interesting, as it were, kind of living together of two worlds, which are fundamentally at odds with each other. And the mediating element is this classical Gothic architecture, which is the architecture of Mr. Soufflo, who was a truly great architect. It is a magical space, there's no doubt about it, and I heartily recommend that you visit it. There's, there's one good guidebook you can buy um, in English that gives you at least the particulars of the story that I sketched out. It's a catalog of all the monuments and what stands behind them, and um, it allows you to better enjoy what you're looking at. So there we have it. We have these, but what is fascinating to me is that both the revolutionaries, because we're still within the horizon of the old world, and their enemy, the Christians, are realizing their ideals still within an ancient architecture. This no longer is true today. Um, which is what gives the building its uncanny magic harmony in spite of the collision of worlds that it in fact represents if you just slightly scratch the surface. And um, nothing can better Im embody it than this image in the apse, which looks like it's a high altar. Um, you, you just, you could even leave the sword, just rename it, and it could be one of, you know, it could be St. Joan of Arc, right? With her sword, just change the name. Okay, this gesture you have to do something about. You can bend the arms a little, replace the, that extension. And certainly she saved France by bringing together the divine with the earthly and, um, this is the power and the ambiguity and also the flexibility of the classical tradition. And I close with these two images, um, our Saint Genevieve at the moment of her death, her soul be being received into heaven, which still presides over the interior if you just move towards the center of the building and look to your right. And this image, which should be our church, we're at a church, this great image by Charles de Wally of the original project for our building. And those of you who are both painters and architects as well can learn a lot from this image and this beautiful vision. At the very least, foreground, middle ground, background, how to balance a painting that could be cripplingly too centered by shifting slightly and composing it in such a way that it's extraordinarily dynamic. And don't forget the dog in the lower foreground, giving it a little bit of everyday vitality. So um, there you have it, the Pantheon, with what haunts, haunts it as represented by that building in the background, St. Stephen on the Mount, saint Etienne de Mont, which has the remains of Saint Genevieve shoved into a corner chapel. Um, she does not preside over the church that was initiated in her honor, and so this is my closing image. Thank you very much. <laughs>